Hello, um, I'm giving this keynote from the University of Southampton, uh, where I work as an Associate Professor of Criminology. I want to start by thanking Rachel Ainsworth and all the organizers of the Software Sustainability Institute's Collaborations Workshop for inviting me to give this presentation. I wish I could be there to give the talk in person and participate uh, in what I am sure will be very insightful and informative discussions about key dimensions of research software development, including the topical issue of ethics. Before I start, I'd like to say a little bit about my professional background. I initially trained as a lawyer, and then I went on to undertake postgraduate studies in criminology and criminal justice. So I would describe myself as a criminologist with an interest in applied criminal justice. So as a criminal justice scholar, my current research focuses on how a variety of software are used by justice systems to respond to crime, and my recent research projects have considered uh, the ethical implications of such software. So in this presentation, I will discuss the importance of ethics when building and deploying software. And I'll also talk about core ethical challenges. I'll start off by considering how best to conceptualize what we mean by ethics and why it is important to consider ethical implications when building software and datasets. Now, my background is in criminology and criminal justice, as I said. So in my talk, I will focus on the software that are deployed by justice systems around the world, and I'll use them as examples to demonstrate why ethics should be at the forefront of software design and deployment, uh, even when uh, software are designed for research purposes. I'll also draw on the example of criminal justice software to describe key ethical challenges and demonstrate how unethical practices can introduce bias and other ha harmful outcomes that can undermine criminal justice principles such as respect for human rights and the right to a fair hearing. Um, in my conclusion, I'll consider what can be done to get to the point where we can envision a digitized world where ethical principles and mechanisms are properly embedded in software design and application. So I said, as I said, this presentation focuses on the importance of ethics when building and using software. But what does ethics mean? Whose ethics should prevail? And which code of ethics should guide software design? I do acknowledge that it is difficult to determine whose and which ethical principles should prevail in a world that is increasingly characterized by a plurality of norms, values, and perspectives. I feel that what this calls for is a situated or a context specific understanding of ethics that is attuned or responsive to the social, cultural, political, and uh, economic realities of the different societies where software systems are built and deployed. So I'm aware that there are likely to be several established codes of ethics and standards for those involved in software design. And while I was doing the research for this keynote, I came across a set of eight principles published by the Association of Computer Machinery, the ACM, and the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, the IEEE. So the principles set out the professional and moral commitments of software engineers. I also came across the IEEE Global Initiatives mission, which is to ensure that every stakeholder involved in the design and development of autonomous and intelligent systems is educated, trained, and empowered to prioritize ethical considerations so that these technologies are advanced for the benefit of humanity. So what this definition implies to me as a social scientist, 
uh, who studies the normative dimensions of software ethics, is that software designers, regardless of context, whether it is in the context of research software design or criminal justice software development, should demonstrate very high levels of professional and personal integrity and the overarching principles and values that should guide ethical software design should all coalesce around the commitment to ensure that new and emerging software do no harm, irrespective of where and why they are built or who builds them. So software engineers, including researchers and others involved in the technical aspects of designing software, must not build products that can be harmful to individuals and wider society. There should be a commitment to building fair, unbiased and transparent systems. But here again, we encounter another problem. How do we define harm or how do we determine what is harmful or what can be considered fair software in any given context or any given society? And do, how do we build harm avoidance principles and strategies into software to improve their ethical quality? So if in our efforts to determine how best to avoid harm, we are inspired by the ethical theory of deontology, we will focus on our perceived duty to avoid harm, even in situations where a harmful outcome can help us attain a greater good in the sense that it can prevent many other harmful consequences. If we decide instead that the ethical theory of utilitarianism is preferable when we consider how best to avoid harm, we will emphasize software design and implementation priorities that can produce the greatest benefits for the greatest number of people. But the question that arises here is how do we know whether a particular design or mode of implementation will achieve this? Then of course, we have to consider other ethical theories such as virtue ethics, which emphasizes that or emphasizes the benefits of modeling technologies on the values and principles of a virtuous actor or agent. But here again, we encounter yet another problem, which is the issue of pluralistic norms and values and the difficulty of determining who a virtuous agent is or what they would do or what practical reasoning they would construct and apply when confronted with an ethical dilemma. So if we cannot determine this, how can we build software on the basis of what a virtuous agent uh, would do? So as we can see, even if we adopt my preferred definition of ethics, which focuses on avoiding harm, we still have to consider how best to integrate these different perspectives on ethical behavior into a comprehensive framework that can guide the design and application of software systems. In fact, I feel that what the different theories show is that there are several perspectives on what constitutes ethical practice, and it is important to take them all into account when we think about the ethics of software design. Now, later on in this presentation, I will describe the strategy of democratization, which can help software developers demonstrate that they have considered various ethical perspectives and concerns during design and have taken steps to address them. So as I said, in this presentation of, uh, on software ethics, I'll focus on the software that are deployed by justice systems around the world, and I will use them as examples to demonstrate why ethics should be at the forefront of software design and how unethical practices can introduce bias and other challenges. Now, several software are applied by justice systems, but in this presentation, I'll use examples of two of the main ones. So I will focus on risk assessment and predictive policing software. Now, to begin with, I should provide a brief description of how the two are applied in justice systems. So they're both data-driven technologies that are used for decision-making and they process large volumes of data, including administrative data sets on criminal history, such as arrests, uh, to predict or forecast crime risks. Now, of the two technologies, risk assessment software 
assess individuals and predict their risks of either absconding while on bail, uh, committing an offense or reoffending. Now the software are used for decision-making by several criminal justice services, including the courts, probation services and prisons. Now the risk assessment technologies have been conceptualized in many different ways. So some refer to them as risk assessment software, uh, others describe them as recidivism risk statistics software, and some prefer the term risk assessment algorithms. So the tools initially emerged several years ago, several decades ago as actuarial systems, but they are increasingly evolving into the new forms of data-driven machine learning technologies that are designed to process large volumes of digital data compiled by law enforcement, or the big data that are emerging from people's interactions with the internet, social media, and other data-driven and data-producing technologies. Now, just like risk assessment software, predictive policing software are also data-driven, but they predict not only individual risks, uh, they also predict crime risk locations. They are used for predictive analytics by police services in many countries and several varieties of the software exist. Uh, again, several te terminologies are also used to conceptualize them, including you know, predictive policing software and predictive policing algorithms. So why is it important to think about ethics when building this software or other similar systems, including research software? I think these headlines uh, that you can see on this slide can help us answer the question of why ethical considerations are important. So, you know, what do these headlines share in common? Well, I feel that they highlight the problem of bias, which is one of the ethical issues that should be considered during software design. And I also feel that an implication of such neg negative headlines is that they can undermine public trust, but they also compel us to think about ethical challenges and implications and importance of considering them during software design. So the headlines also alert us to the possibility that although new and emerging technologies such as the data-driven software that are used by justice systems to predict risks may in theory have very many positive prospects, they also pose a number of ethical challenges that should be considered during design and deployment. So, you know, what are some of the key ethical challenges to bear in mind? Bias is a commonly cited ethical problem. And here I'll provide one example of how bias can arise from software design. And this relates to the selection of data, which is a key factor that can introduce bias. So, you know, going back to my example of the software that are deployed by justice systems, uh, bias is an ethical challenge that stems partly from the data on which the software rely to label people and locations as risky and deserving of criminal justice intervention and surveillance. So the software process large volumes of input data and their results or outputs are usually probabilistic distributions which are then used to predict risks such as the risks of absconding while on bail or risk of engaging in future criminal activity. Now the input data on which the technologies rely are selected by the developers and key examples are, you know, data on arrests, data on criminal convictions and or data on other criminal justice outcomes. Uh, so using such data can pose ethical implications. So arrest data, for example, can in some cases represent record, records of biased policing rather than actual criminality. But if predictive software are designed to interpret arrests as objective risk indicators or risk predictors, then individuals and communities that are vulnerable to biased arrests will also become vulnerable to higher risk scores. And in this way, the software can reproduce, amplify and entrench historical forms of bias. So, you know, what this suggests is that 
in justice systems and even in the context of research software design, it is important to recognize that the way different groups and communities are represented or made visible in data can influence the way they are treated. If certain communities are more vulnerable to historical biases and discrimination, and care is not taken to take this into account during data selection and software design, the biases and discrimination can become amplified and entrenched. So it's necessary to consider these issues very carefully, uh, particularly when designing software that will inform decision making in high stakes domains such as you know, justice systems, where biased outputs can expose affected groups to harms such as you know, unwarranted uh, punitive intervention. So apart from bias, there are several other ethical challenges that those who design software should consider. Um, an example is the capacity of their products to undermine respect for human autonomy. And you know, this problem can arise in situations where software applications leave little room for human oversight and decision making or in circumstances where such applications expose people to unwarranted surveillance, which denies them the opportunity to live their lives without the intrusion of external, external parties. So in justice system, this problem can arise in situations where biased risk predictions, for example, uh, result in enhanced uh, surveillance or even imprisonment. You know, such outcomes can deprive those who are affected of the opportunity to continue leading a law abiding lifestyle or to live their lives without the intrusion of law enforcement and other authorities. Another commonly cited ethical issue is the violation of privacy and other rights. Now this challenge can arise in several contexts of software design, including research software development. So in terms of privacy rights, you know, ethical problems arise when design processes violate data protection requirements, which deal with issues such as the protection of personal data, the ownership of data, and maintaining the right to privacy. Now, in some justice systems, law enforcement authorities, such as the police, are exempt from several data protection regulations, but the failure to comply with even basic data protection requirements can expose affected individuals and communities to unnecessary and intrusive surveillance. Now, lack of transparency and accountability are additional ethical challenges, and they're both reinforced by factors such as, you know, the lack of a comprehensive legal framework, and also the trade secret laws and regulations that protect software developers from, you know, revealing the contents of their code. Um, in justice systems, you know, such lack of transparency can deprive risk subjects of the right to rebut the evidence laid out against them. Uh, in court and could undermine several rights, including the right to a fair hearing. Now, a critical scholarship within the field of science, uh, technology and society uh, has produced a number of concepts that can help broaden our understanding of why a consideration of ethics is important during uh, software design. Um, I don't have enough time in this presentation to go through as many of the concepts as I would like, but I have listed two examples on this screen. So uh, if we start off with the concept of uh, digital capital, it draws attention to the communities and the groups who tend to bear much of the burden of unethical practice and why developers involved in re research software design, uh, criminal justice software design or other design contexts uh, should pay attention to this, to this issue. Um, digital capital can be defined as the ability to acquire the resources that are required for exploiting the full benefits of software development. So, you know, some examples of the resources include, you know, the knowledge, skills, or the capital that, you know, equip developers with the power and the ability to build software and other technologies. Now, when we think about software design generally, those who design such technologies are the ones who are equipped with digital capital. 
They have the power to use their values, their choices and preferences to design the technologies. And they enjoy much of the rewards, while those who often bear much of the risks, inclu uh, including the burden of unethical practice, are the historically marginalized individuals and communities who can become exposed to harms such as unwarranted surveillance and other harmful interventions. So this uneven distribution of risks and rewards uh, is evident in the data-driven software that are applied in many domains. So for example, it's, it has been shown that the software that are used by public services in the United States to assess welfare eligibility or child protection issues often profile and label low-income groups as risky and undeserving. Um, others have shown that the software that are used to enforce uh, immigration rules mainly target low income travelers for more invasive surveillance uh, and enforcement. In the same way, predictive policing algorithm that, algorithms or predictive policing software that are used to identify crime risk locations often focus on the crimes committed in over-policed low-income areas that are usually uh, more populated by minorities. So, you know, these are problems that should be considered by software developers interested in designing technologies that are ethical and do no harm to in, or do not harm individuals and communities. So another concept I want to highlight here is data justice. Now, this concept has been framed in various ways by different disciplines, but here I want to focus on a conceptualization that emphasizes the importance of ensuring that as societies continue to advance towards datafication, you know, which involves the transformation of key aspects of social life and human activity into data, those who collect the digital data that are used for software design should ensure that such data are collected and used fairly. So this relates to my earlier point about the importance of ensuring that the way the people from whom such data are collected are made visible and represented does not expose them to bias or any other outcomes that can harm them. So a related concept is data valence, which is you know, another useful concept that can broaden our understanding of why it's important to pay attention to ethics during software design. So the concept refers to the practice of designing and applying data-driven technologies that facilitate the enhanced and sometimes unwarranted surveillance of individuals and communities. And you know, we've seen that in justice systems, risk assessment tools and predictive policing software that rely on biased data can expose certain minorities and locations to unnecessary and intrusive criminal justice surveillance and control. So what this implies is that those who are committed to ethical practice should carefully consider how they select the data sets they use for software design. So together, the concepts of digital capital capital and data justice are useful for thinking about the ethics of software design and the harms of unethical practice. I mean, I feel that digital capital in particular reminds us that we should not only focus on data related issues when we talk about ethics, we should also consider how power differences in society can determine who gets to design software and who gets exposed to the risks and harms of unethical software. You know, many studies continue to show that the least powerful uh, groups in society pay the ethical debt associated with uh, data-driven software, whilst those equipped with digital capital are more, are more likely to enjoy the benefits and the rewards, and they're often in a more powerful position. So the concept of digital capital allows us to reflect on broader ethical challenges and to recognize that software design and application are embedded in existing social conditions and would adopt and reflect the power imbalances already existing in society. So I want to conclude this presentation with a brief reflection of what can be done to mitigate harms and promote ethical practice. And I'll focus on what should be done at design level and at societal level. 
So at design level, attention has to be paid to technical issues, you know, such as data quality, um, and also, you know, the values that inform uh, the selection of data sets and the way the data sets are processed that produce outputs. So the use of data sets that expose communities uh, to bias and other harms, of course, should be avoided. Um, technical fixes, such as trying to debias the data, um, have been developed, and there are there have, for example, been you know several attempts to debias the data on which the risk assessment software applied in justice systems rely for prediction. So the biasing mainly involves the effort to either remove protected or sensitive features such as race from the data, or taking steps to reduce their influence uh, on risk predictions. Now, the bias in data could also involve managing the impact of such characteristics on the data instead of removing them. But a limitation of this approach is that it, you know, it aims to attain data neutrality, and it's therefore based on the utopic assumption that data can be neutral and unaffected by the influence of those who collect and use them. Um, so, but apart from the bias in data sets, additional techno, uh, technical approaches have been introduced to address other ethical challenges, you know, such as poor transparency and accountability. So while these technical approaches at least show that efforts are being made to mitigate the harms of software design and application, I feel that societal level approaches also have to be considered to get us to the point where we can envision a digitized world where ethical principles and mechanisms are properly embedded in technology design and application. So for example, there should be efforts to reverse the uneven distribution of risks of unethical uh, software design. So the introduction of comprehensive legal frameworks that can encourage you know, greater accountability can help achieve this, although it appears that there is some resistance to this on the basis that you know, inflexible, inflexible regulation may undermine technological innovation. Another remedial strategy that can help reverse the uneven distribution of risks that are you know, currently associated with unethical software design is the democratization of design processes, which I, I mentioned earlier on in this presentation. Now, this strategy is being piloted by some criminal justice services in some parts of the United States with a degree of success. It involves allowing the communities and other stakeholders whose lives are often negatively affected by unethical software to have a say in some of the choices and decisions that influence the creation of technologies. So there should be an effort to encourage some form of public engagement in the process. You know, this can help ensure that diverse perspectives are taken into account. It's also a useful way of anticipating diverse ethical challenges and how to mitigate or address them. And it is an approach that can involve what is known as co-design, which has been proposed in several high stakes uh, domains, including healthcare contexts. Now, audits that can comprehensively evaluate key dimensions of software systems, you know, from their design logics, data inputs, and data processing dimensions, their outputs, uh, and the potential impact on the target population, can also help identify how to embed ethical principles in software design. There should be internal audits and independent third-party ethical audits for, you know, external accountability. So to conclude, from what we have seen, uh, it is important to consider ethical implications during software design, particularly in high stakes domains uh, such as justice systems, where software applications can influence decisions about people's access to justice and to their civil rights and freedoms. You know, as the use of data driven software continues to grow across many jurisdictions and continues to form part of, you know, what some have referred to as the fourth industrial revolution that is being driven by the ever increasing availability of large scale data. It is becoming even more important to consider ethical implications. I mean, I do acknowledge that software development can potentially produce immeasurable benefits and enhance the quality of life. Uh, while it is important to recognize this, I hope that my presentation has shown 
that it is equally important to anticipate ethical challenges and consider how best to avoid them. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you.